There's no house in Alabama, or even in the South, like the fine Carlisle House in Marion, Alabama, on the outskirts of Marion. Construction on this large plantation home started in possibly the 1830s and continued for more than 10 years. And it doesn't look like the antebellum homes of the South. It lacks those tall columns and those wide verandas. It has an architectural style all its own. A mixture of Italian, even of Japanese influence. A little Gothic. A pleasing combination. Edwin Carlyle started his house probably in the late 1830s. Took him more than 10 years to complete it. The bricks, they say, were imported, probably used as ballast on ships that came into Mobile and even up the river to Montgomery. And the pink field stones used to accentuate the arches and the doorways here. Magnificent house, walls 28 inches thick. And the glory of the house, so people who lived here always said, was this, this tower room high up that has access by a graceful, curving stairway. And it was here that the young daughter in the Carlisle family, Anne, liked to come, play, read. You can almost feel her presence here. She must have played with dolls here and probably played jacks with her friends. They told stories here sang songs. It was an ideal place for a child to play a kind of retreat high above the rest of the house. And as she grew older, Anne would come often alone to this room and sit in the window and gaze out on the landscape there, formal gardens that her father had planted, dream the dreams that young girls dream. And the hero of all her dreams was a neighbor boy young man she had grown up with, and they used to play together, and when they were children, they would talk about when they got big and would be able to marry, and they would laugh about it and plan their wedding. And as they grew older, they continued to talk about when they got big, old enough to marry. Well, they loved each other very much. And they probably would have had a grand wedding here in this house had not the war between the states come up. And when that war came, Anne's lover was one of the first to volunteer for service. And many young couples hurried up with their wedding plans and got married before the young man rode off to serve in the Confederate Army. But they decided to wait until he came back home because he assured her, oh, the war won't last long and I'll be back, Anne and we'll have a fine wedding then. And they said goodbye. Perhaps she told him goodbye in this very room. And he said, you know, my body servant, the slave who grew up with me has been my playmate all my life, is going off with me to war, Big Tom. And I will send him back with news of me after the first battle. And if I am all right, you will see Big Tom riding up that driveway, waving a white flag. But if, God forbid, I'm killed, he'll carry a red banner. And so Anne began her vigil in this room. She would come up and watch, hoping to hear the, the horse hooves coming up the walk and hoping to see the white flag that would mean that her lover was all right. And weeks and months passed. As time went by, she seldom left this square tower room. They would bring her meals up and she would eat. She could not bear to be a moment away from the window watching for Big Tom. And then one day as she was keeping her lonely vigil here, she heard the sound of horses' hooves approaching and looked out and saw Big Tom coming. And he was 
waving the red flag, indication that her papa had been killed. And in her grief, sorrow, and dash from this window ledge, went over to that winding stairway and threw herself over the edge, crashed to her death below. And after that, people living in this house and visitors coming here began to tell of hearing the sound of weeping and a shout of misery and unhappiness, a farewell to this world as a young girl would tumble over the stairway. And some nights, they said, they would see her wandering here Beautiful young girl, white gown, looking around as though she were trying to find the lost lover, the joy of her life. What a wonderful place for a ghost to be.